More than 18 months have passed since the start of Putin's unprovoked full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Kyiv in three days has turned into the biggest war in Europe since World War II. In the second half of August, the focus has gone back to the Zaporizhia front, where Ukraine is pushing hard to achieve a decisive breakthrough. We will describe the situation on the battlefield, Ukraine's insistence on taking the war to Russia, the death of the ill-fated and infamous Russian war hero Prigozhin, and much more in this update on the war in Ukraine. And this is another report brought to you by NordVPN, with a special offer available to our viewers at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. More on that in a second. NordVPN routes your internet traffic through servers of your choice all over the world and crucially encrypts all this data during transit. Encrypted data is almost impossible for those spying on you to make sense of, be they advertisers, scammers, criminals, or even official surveillance services, and your IP address will be that of a Nord server and not your actual devices, keeping your business private even further. Privacy is one thing, but also moving your IP lets you do useful things like watch TV shows that are only unlocked for certain regions, which happens all the time on the big services you're already paying for. Or do the opposite and browse stuff only available at home while you're away. And that's only the start, but it's time for the offer. By using our exclusive link, nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals, you can buy a two-year plan and get four bonus months added on top across all of Nord's plans. There's a 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee if you start using NordVPN then decide against it, so there's no harm in at least trying it out. Get that offer and secure your link to the internet at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. After completing the liberation of Uruzhaina by August 16th, the main focus of Ukrainian assaults on the Zaporizhia front was Robotina and the area around it. The geolocated footage already shows that battles were occurring in the center of Robotina. In the following days, it was reported that the 47th Mechanized Brigade had reached the southeastern outskirts of the village. On August 23rd, the fighters of the 47th Brigade placed the Ukrainian flag in Robotina. As of early September, Ukraine has fully liberated Robotina, which it has been fighting for since the start of the counteroffensive. Russia is still launching counterattacks on the southern edges of the village, which shows the strategic value of Robotina to the Russian army. Zaporizhia Oblast consists mostly of open fields, thus any elevation is a natural advantage. Robotina is on such an elevation and overlooks occupied areas in the east and southwest. But so far, Russian attempts to regain control of the village have been in vain. On the contrary, the Ukrainians have expanded their area of control around Robotina. The AFU has advanced towards Novopokrovka and Novopokropivka since then. There is also visually confirmed information that forward Ukrainian units are already fighting in the outskirts of Vibova, which means that at least some Ukrainian forces have crossed the first Sorovakin line west of the village. So far, we have not seen heavy weapons being deployed by Ukraine in this area, which may indicate that the breach has not happened yet. It is merely Ukrainian recon forces operating in the area. But the presence of Ukrainian forces beyond the first Sorovakin line proves that defensive lines are as strong as the forces defending it. Many analysts have focused only on much-discussed Sorovakin lines, but footage from the liberated areas of Zaporizhia Oblast and reports of Ukrainian servicemen demonstrate that the Russians had strong defensive structures north of these lines too. Dense minefields, many strongholds and a system of trenches in the open field is a challenging environment to conduct offensive operations, particularly in the absence of air superiority. So Russian defensive structures north of the Sorovakin line may have been at least as tough to cross as the Sorovakin line itself. Some analysts even argue that the Ukrainian army has already passed the densest minefield in the Robotina sector, and logically speaking, areas south of it cannot be as densely mined, since the Russians would need wider mine-free corridors to fall back if necessary. On August 26th, Reuters reported a claim by a Ukrainian commander currently fighting in the Zaporizhia Oblast, who said that he believes that they have broken through the most difficult line of Russian defenses and that further advance will be less costly. The Russian command has been sending reinforcements to the Zaporizhia front to contain the Ukrainian advance. Elements of the 7th, 76th and 108th Air Assault VDV divisions have been redeployed from the Kherson and North Lahansk front to this end. In this period, Ukraine has also gained some ground east of Uruzhaina and south of Rivnipil. It is notable how the Ukrainian success in Robotina has changed the mood in the West. 
At the start of the discussed period, many mainstream Western media outlets had expressed pessimism about the Ukrainian counteroffensive, but towards the end of August, their rhetoric became significantly more optimistic. For instance, on August 17th, the Washington Post reported about the assessment of American intelligence, claiming that the Ukrainian army would fail to reach Melitopol, the supposed main goal of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. While on August 24th, the Wall Street Journal reported that the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, Solushny, told American military officials that the AFU is on the verge of a breakthrough. The news reports of Western media outlets often rely on anonymous sources in the US government, and change in the rhetoric, if nothing else, informs about a change of mood in the American elite regarding the Ukrainian counteroffensive. According to Forbes, Ukraine sent the 46th Airmobile Brigade and the 82nd Air Assault Brigade into battle in this period, which means that now almost all the forces dedicated to the counteroffensive have taken part in battles in some fashion. If this report is correct, the next several weeks may prove decisive. Forbes reports that Ukraine's Leopard 2 losses in the south have been exaggerated. They claim that the AFU has permanently lost only five of its 71 Leopard 2 tanks since the start of the counteroffensive in June. At least 10 more have been damaged, which are being repaired in Poland and Germany to be sent back to the front. This indicates that even though nominally all Ukrainian brigades dedicated to the counteroffensive in the south are already fighting, many main battle tanks are kept in reserve in order to use them later if the AFU achieves a decisive breakthrough. They will likely continue trying to advance along the T0408 highway towards Tokmak and attack towards Vobova and Ocheritavata to expand its salient south of Orykiv. In the Velika Novosilka section, Ukrainian assaults have been less regular since the liberation of Urizhina, but they will probably continue their attempts to reach the Kaminchik and Staromlenivka line as an intermediate goal. On other fronts of the war, the situation has not changed much. On the Hassan front, raids of Ukrainian groups on the left bank of the Dnipro continue, but they have probably lost their positions near Kazachilaheri. On the North Luhansk front, Russia made minor gains near Sinkivka and Serebryansky forest, but Ukraine has stabilized the situation here after continuous gains by the Russian army in this area in the past few weeks. On the other hand, Ukraine's advance around Bakhmut has been negligible too. It was reported that on August 20th, Ukrainian troops gained some ground along the MO3 highway towards Bakivka, but their advance has largely stopped since the capture of dominant heights near Klishchivka. In this period, the Ukrainians picked up the pace of aerial strikes and saboteur attacks in the Russian rear, while Russia continued targeting Ukraine's port infrastructure and other civilian areas. On August 16th and 23rd, Shahed drones were launched on Odessa and Mykolaiv oblasts, damaging some of the port infrastructure. This did not prevent Ukraine from shipping some of its grain into international markets on August 16th and 27th, as Kyiv wanted to demonstrate that Russia's permission would not be necessary to ship grain out of the Black Sea. On the other hand, it is reported that Russia is in talks with Turkey on shipping its grain to international markets without Ukraine's participation. Perhaps the most painful Russian airstrike in this period was launched on the drone exposition in Chernihiv on August 19th, which killed seven people and injured more than 100. On the same day, the Ukrainians launched a drone strike on Saltsy Air Base in Novgorod Oblast, damaging one or two Tu-22M strategic bombers. On August 23rd, Ukraine destroyed Russia's S-400 Triumph modern air defense system in Crimea. On August 30th, Ukraine launched a massive drone attack on six Russian regions, destroying two IL-76 transport aircraft and damaging two others at the Pskov airfield. Budinov has already stated the goal of these attacks, taking the war to Russia to retaliate against strikes on Ukrainian soil. Land combat will inevitably become less intense with the start of the rainy season, and we can assume that both sides will launch more aerial attacks on each other. Kyiv got some excellent news in terms of military aid in the second half of August. On August 15th, the Swedish government announced the 13th military aid package to Ukraine worth $314 million, which included spare parts and ammunition for CV-90 armoured combat vehicles and Stritzwagen 122 tanks, along with trucks, demining equipment and air-to-air Yatrobot 99 missiles with a range of 75 kilometers. On August 17th, 
Germany delivered another military aid package, including two more IRIS-T air defense systems, ten ground surveillance radar systems, trucks and ammo. On August 18th, the keel was laid for Ukraine's second Adder-class corvette in Istanbul. On August 18th, some official information about Western-made jets for Ukraine finally came through. Zelensky stated that Ukraine's pilots started test trials on Swedish Gripen fighter jets. This was followed by Zelensky's announcement that the Netherlands will give Ukraine F-16 fighter jets after Ukrainian pilots complete the training. The Netherlands has 42 F-16s, and the exact number of fighter jets to be given to the Ukrainian Air Force will be declared following the completion of the training. Denmark also pledged F-16s, giving a more concrete number, 19 jets, 6 of them by the end of 2023, 8 in 2024, and 5 in 2025. Later, Norway promised at least two F-16s as well. According to the New York Times, the United States will also train Ukrainian pilots starting in September. It is a long, anticipated announcement for Ukraine. Ukrainian diplomacy has been working hard to persuade the West to change its stance on the delivery of fighter jets. One may assume that more Western countries will follow up with relevant pledges. The training of pilots will take some time, and it is expected that the Ukrainian Air Force will be able to start using F-16 sometime in the first half of 2024. F-16s are not going to win the war for Ukraine immediately, but they are going to give options to the Ukrainian army, which it lacked so far. They will be an instant upgrade on the Soviet-era jets that Ukraine has, since they have a more powerful radar, capable of intercepting targets within a range of up to 150 kilometers. The F-16 is compatible with most Western-made missiles, significantly enhancing the ranged capability for the Ukrainian army. They will also serve the purpose of mobile air defense systems, due to their capability to target Russian jets with missiles like air-to-air AIM-120 AMRAMs. F-16s will go a long way to improving the Ukrainian army's offensive and defensive capabilities. On August 23rd, the Finnish Prime Minister Oppo announced a military aid package worth 94 million euros. On August 24th, the Turkish military industry corporation Baikar gave a TB2 Bayraktar drone to Ukraine dedicated to its Independence Day. Also on that day, Norway promised $140 million worth of energy supplies to Ukraine. Lithuania pledged a military aid package worth $44 million. Germany delivered Patriot missiles, eight drone detection systems, and 40 IQ-35 recon drones. On August 29th, the United States announced a $250 million military aid package, which includes AIM-9 air-to-air missiles, mine-clearing equipment, HIMARS munitions, and Javelin anti-tank weapons. The bad news for Ukraine is that the resolution of the ATA CMS matter does not seem any closer. According to the Washington Post, the Pentagon thinks that the United States is not in a position to spare any ATA CMS missiles for Ukraine, as it may hurt America's readiness to oppose China if such a conflict arises. There are still not many updates regarding foreign military support to Russia. Iran remains the main military supplier of Russia. There are reports that the Russian army has started using 120mm mortar shells produced in Iran. Russia is also increasing the domestic production of modified Shahed drones in the Alabuga Special Economic Zone of the Republic of Tatarstan. The Washington Post reported, based on leaked documents from the facility, that Russia intends to build 6,000 Shahed drones by 2025. According to the Financial Times, the USA has offered Iran to stop supplying drones to Russia in exchange for mitigation of the sanctions regime but it is unlikely that an agreement on this matter is possible in the foreseeable future. It is notable that according to Zelensky, as of August 19th, Russia has launched more than 6,500 missiles and 3,500 drones on Ukraine since the start of the war. Drones and cruise missiles will likely remain as important components of the Russian war strategy in Ukraine. More news of unrest and conflict inside the Russian elite continued flowing in this period. A Bloomberg article on August 19th claimed that security hardliners in the Russian elite are in favor of dismissing Shoigu and Gerasimov, along with launching another wave of mobilization in Russia. Rumors of mobilization in Russia have picked up pace in recent weeks. On August 25th, Budinov claimed that Russia is considering mobilizing a further 450,000 men for the war in Ukraine. On August 22nd, finally some news about Sergei Sorovkin came out. 
Russian media reported about his dismissal as the commander of the Russian Air Force. Apparently, the Russian elite is still convinced that Sorovakin's loyalty belonged to Prigozhin during the March of Justice. Speaking of Prigozhin, as widely expected, the imperfect war hero of Russia, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was finally punished for his coup attempt. On August 23rd, Prigozhin and several Wagner commanders, including the neo-Nazi Dmitry Utkin, died in a plane crash. Preliminary information shows that the plane crashed as a result of a bomb explosion on board. There are very few doubts about who the man behind this explosion is. Prigozhin was not going to be pardoned for his treason. If there were any doubts about the future of Wagner, now with the death of Prigozhin and several of the organization's commanders, there are none. Earlier in August, NATO chief Stoltenberg's chief of staff stated that the war could end with Ukraine agreeing to give up territories in exchange for NATO membership. Stoltenberg later refuted this claim, but it showed the mood circulating, at least in parts of the Western elites. Since then, Western leaders reiterated their position of unwavering support to Ukraine, and the pledge of F-16s, which will arrive no earlier than 2024, demonstrate that the Western support will likely continue in some shape in the foreseeable future. It is good news for Ukraine, which is increasing the pressure on Russian defenses on the Zaporizhia front. Casualties continue mounting for both sides. According to US officials cited by the New York Times, Russia has suffered 120,000 KIA and up to 180,000 wounded in Ukraine, while the Ukrainian deaths were close to 70,000 with 100 to 120,000 wounded. According to the Oryx blog, the visually confirmed losses for Russia as of September 2nd are 2,280 tanks, 4,610 vehicles, 249 command posts and communication stations, 908 artillery systems and vehicles, 257 multiple rocket launchers, 88 aircraft, 104 helicopters and 294 drones. For Ukraine, these are 631 tanks, 1,972 vehicles, 16 command posts and communication stations, 392 artillery systems and vehicles, 50 multiple rocket launchers, 71 aircraft, 34 helicopters, and 177 drones. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.